All right, let's, um, let's go ahead and get started today. And remember, this is your, your last class before the Thanksgiving break. We're not meeting on Tuesday. I am designating Tuesday as a self-study day. So that means essentially you just do what you want on Tuesday. But I'm assuming you're all going to sit down at 1230 and spend an hour and 50 minutes reading your book or looking through the slides or working problems. If you don't, just don't tell me about it. Oh, good. Okay. Now, you will notice uh, if you go to Canvas, your fourth quiz, actually Tuesday at 1230, you might want to work quiz four. Uh, because quiz number four will open today at 2 o'clock. It covers chapter seven, which is the stock valuation chapter. And it opens today at 2. It closes Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. So you've got a lot of time to finish it before you concentrate on turkey and dressing. Um, I'm, what we're going to do today is I'm going to take a look at Canvas really quickly, show you uh, your uh, study guide and kind of where we're going to go from here for the rest of the, uh, the rest of the chapters. So if you uh, if you go down, you can see quiz four here. And it's just, again, five questions, 30 minutes to take the quiz, three chances to take it, highest grade counts. And remember, out of the quiz grades, your highest um, three quiz grades are counted out of the four. And also keep in mind, I still have people contacting me saying my grade on Canvas is really low because I messed up on quiz one or quiz two or quiz three. Keep in mind that the grades on Canvas are not weighted correctly, okay? The quizzes on Canvas count the same as a test. So if you screwed up and made a 40 on one of the quizzes, it's going to have a very negative effect on your overall grade, whereas in reality, the quizzes only count 6% each for three quizzes for a total of 18%, and the tests count 26% each for a total of 78% of your grade. So don't, don't worry too much about that if, you're, if your grade on Canvas uh, looks a little low. Now, if you take a look at the study guide for the final exam and the bonus test, you will see here, um, We've got chapter six and chapter seven for the final exam, which we've covered that already. Now, for the rest of the final, and this may be a little confusing at first, but it'll, it will make more sense as we go through it. We're going to include on the final exam, the first six slides from chapter 10, and then the slides from chapter 11. And there's only about six or seven or eight slides in chapter 11. So not a lot of information. And then on the bonus test, which we, I said the bonus test is 15 questions. They count one point each. You cannot hurt yourself by taking this. Any of the questions you get correct, correct on the bonus test count a point towards your final exam grade. So if you get 10 out of 15 right, you get 10 extra points added to your final exam. The bonus test is going to cover slides from chapter, the remaining slides from chapter 10, which are slides 7 through 30. And then chapter 12, which I think includes only two, one or two, maybe three slides. So it seems like a lot of chapters, but there's just lots of bits and pieces of chapters that we will cover from here on out. We're skipping chapter nine completely. So uh, we've covered chapter eight earlier in the semester with test number two. So six, seven, 10, 11, or parts of 10, 11, and 12. Everybody follow me on this, making making sense, and it will make a lot more sense as we as we cover the material today, uh, the Tuesday when we come back from Thanksgiving, and the Thursday when we return from Thanksgiving break, and then of course your final exam. In this class is going to be on the Tuesday of finals week at 1:30 in this classroom. So the Tuesday of finals week at 1:30 in this class. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead to chapter 10 and cover the first six slides. Then if we have time, we'll jump over to chapter 11. Let me work my way back here. All right, so chapter 10. Basically, chapter 10 consists of two different areas. One, the first part of it, the first six slides are all just terms. There's no calculations associated with it. 
It's just terms associated with capital budgeting. And then we'll go to chapter 11, which are just some more terms associated with capital budgeting. And then the calculations, the actual capital budgeting techniques, they come in in chapter, excuse me, in slides 7 through 30. And then chapter 12 actually has no calculations in it. So really the capital budgeting techniques of slides of 7 through 30, which will be on your bonus test, that's all you have left in terms of using your financial calculator for this semester. Now, we're taking us, we're changing course just a little bit because up to this point, we've talked about bonds in chapter six and stock in chapter seven, capital, uh, common stock and preferred stock. Those were ways that a company could raise money to finance various projects. So I gave an example of a new factory. In chapter 10, 11, and 12, we're, we're tying this together because we're going to look at ways that once a company can raise money through issuing stocks or bonds, then how do they decide how to invest it? What is a good investment? What is a bad investment? And that is what we call capital budgeting analysis. So we're going to take the cash raised by issuing stocks or bonds in chapter six and seven, and we're going to determine how do we select a good investment or how do we um, separate a good investment from a bad investment. But there's a lot of terminology involved, and so that's what we're going to start with in Chapter 10. So the first definition here is capital budgeting. And it says capital budgeting is a process of evaluating and selecting long-term investments that are consistent with the firm's goal of maximizing shareholder wealth. So in simple terms, what this means is this is how a company decides how to choose or how to invest in large, expensive, long-term projects. So a factory. If you build a factory, you expect that factory to last for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. If you purchase, if you're a farmer, you purchase a new combine, you, you know, you're going to spend $300,000 on a new combine. You expect that combine to last for four, five, six years, seven years. Um, grain bins if you're a farmer you expect them to last a long time so these are large purchases a lot of cash and long-term purchases and that's what we call a capital expenditure it's an outlay of funds expected to produce benefits for more than one year now we also have what's called a current expenditure or an operating expenditure these are short term this these provide benefits for less than a year so I might decide to spend I may have a large corporation. I might spend $100,000 on copy paper. But copy paper is not a capital expenditure. It's not expected to last for three, four, five years. It is a short-term expenditure. Ink pens, um, bottled water for the break room. I mean, these are what we call current expenditures, short-term expenditures. Now, they can be expensive. The ones I just mentioned aren't, but they can be expensive. But if they provide benefits for less than one year, they're a current expenditure, more than one year, a capital expenditure. Now, this is the capital budgeting process. You don't necessarily have to memorize every one of these definitions, but I would like for you to know, in general, the steps in the process. And they're pretty much common sense. Step one, when it comes to analyzing the investment of a large amount of cash is generating proposals. So what are some options for us? If we're a company, we've got some cash available to invest, how do we want to invest it? Do we want to build a new factory? Do we want to expand on a product line? Do we want to um, retire some debt, pay off some debt? Or do we want to maybe buy back some stock like we looked at in chapter seven, which is, we call it treasury stock? Number two, review and analysis. So this is part of the capital budgeting process. Decision making, so which one are we going to invest in or are we going to invest in maybe in, in, in none of them. Implementation, so that's putting it into, uh, into the works. And then finally, follow up. And number five actually uh, is ignored a lot of times because you want to go back and take a look at your analysis to see, okay, we went through this process of trying to determine should we spend $50 million on a new factory we said it was a good investment, but if you go back and look at it later, you can kind of analyze, was it a good investment? 
did we go wrong somewhere? Because as you'll see as we go through this process, there is a lot of guessing when it comes to capital budgeting, a lot of estimation, a lot of theory. Because we have to, for example, if we're going to build a new factory, you have to determine, first of all, what's it going to cost. So you're trying to estimate over the next two or three years as you're starting to build the factory, what's it going to cost? Secondly, you have to estimate, are we going to have enough employees in the area that will fully staff our factory? Are they educated enough? Is the right training? That type of thing. Then you have to estimate going forward what cash flows is this factory going to create. So what's it? How much are we going to be able to produce in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, maybe year ten or fifteen? So that's a long time in the future to have to estimate what a factory is going to produce. So that's it's a really tough. Once you get past year two or three, I mean you're basically guessing. Now the thing is, when it comes to capital budgeting. If you're good at this, and some people just, I don't know what it is about it, but some people just tend to be better at capital budgeting analysis than others. And to be good at it, you have to be one of those people who can somewhat have a vision, an accurate vision for the future. Of what do we think is gonna happen? And I can't really put my finger on what it takes to do that, but if you're good at it, you can make a lot of money working for corporations doing capital budgeting analysis. Because the worst thing that you can do as a corporation is you can take $50 million of stockholders' money, build a factory outside of Murray, Kentucky, and four years into the, having the factory built, realize, man, we screwed up. We should not have built a factory outside of Murray, Kentucky because we don't have access to the proper logistics. We don't have access to a rail line. We don't have uh, good access to an interstate system. We can't get enough employees with the right training to staff our factory. Or in, labor costs are more expensive than we thought. I mean, there's lots of things that can go wrong when it comes to spending $50 million of stockholders' money, but you really want to try to guess right if you can. Now, these are some terms that you need to be familiar with, and it will make a difference. I'll talk later about why this makes a big difference. The first is the types of projects. And we've got two different terms here, independent projects and mutually exclusive projects. The first one listed here, independent projects, these are projects whose cash flows are unrelated to each other. So what this means is accepting one does not eliminate the others from further consideration. Or, in simple terms, if projects are independent, we can choose as many as meet our minimum acceptance criteria. You can choose one project, you can choose seven projects if you can afford to invest in them. The other type is what we call mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive projects essentially do the same thing. So what that means is, in simple terms, we can only choose one project if it meets our minimum criteria. So we may be analyzing five projects. They all do the same thing, but we're gonna choose the, if they all meet our minimum criteria, we're gonna choose the best project. We can only choose one. So you need to know the difference between independent projects and mutually exclusive projects. Also, a couple of definitions here when it comes to investing in different projects. We have unlimited funds versus capital rationing. Unlimited funds, as the name implies, simply means a company has unlimited capital to invest. Now, in textbooks, we see that sometimes. It's just, you know, a corporation has as much money as it needs to invest in every single project that comes along. In reality, that doesn't happen very often because corporations, just like us, they have to pick and choose how they spend their money. So they can't spend it on every single good investment that comes along. They have to choose the best investment. Now, capital rationing is more of what maybe you or I practice, and that is you have a set amount of money that you can spend or a set amount of money that you can invest, and you have to choose how do we invest that money. So we have to ration it 
a million here, five million here, 10 million there, whatever the situation may be, depending on the size of the corporation and the size of your capital budget. A couple of other terms, accept, reject approach versus ranking approaches. Um, fairly straightforward here. This is if you have projects using the accept, reject approach. You either take on the project and accept it, or you don't, you reject it. I mean, it's just pretty cut and dry in terms of, of what we do here. A ranking approach is simply we're ranking the projects from best to worst. So we may have five different projects, we rate them one through five, and then we simply start investing in the best ones until we run out of money in terms of the capital that we have to invest in these projects. Now, those are the first six slides. What we're gonna do here, we'll come back here when we come back from Thanksgiving break. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to chapter 11 here in a second, but I wanted to explain to you, these are the first six slides. So this is what's gonna be on your final exam. And then when we get to the bonus test material, I'll come back to chapter 10. We'll jump to capital budgeting techniques and we'll go through some calculations using your financial calculator of things like payback period, net present value, internal rate of return, that type of thing. Okay, so those are the first six slides from chapter 10. Now let me go and jump ahead to chapter 11. Now, in chapter 11, what we're looking at are the cash flows associated with capital budgeting investments. And again, this is kind of, it will all fit together, I promise you, as we go through 10, 11, jump back to chapter 10, it, it will make a little more sense. Now, as we're analyzing an investment, a large scale investment, the factory that I've been using as an example, what we're looking for are what we call relevant cash flows, and you need to know the definition of a relevant cash flow for capital budgeting purposes. And this is the incremental cash outflow, so that's what we're spending, that's what we're investing on this project, this, this factory, and the resulting cash inflows based on this investment or this, this factory that we're building. So essentially what we're gonna have is we're gonna spend a lot of money at time period zero, which is today, which is a negative cash flow. And then hopefully once we have the factory built, it's going to provide positive cash inflow. Now we have to estimate that. And again, that's part of the problem with capital budgeting is you have to estimate how productive is our factory going to be once we have it built the first year versus year five or year 10. And these, Relevant cash flows, these are what we call incremental cash flows, which are the additional cash flows associated with this investment. Now, we'll talk a little bit later um, about, there are different reasons why you go through capital budgeting analysis. The two most common are either expansion or you're adding to what you already have. So maybe you already have four factories, you're building a fifth, you're expanding. That's pretty simple to calculate the additional cash flow because you can simply look at what does it cost us versus what does it bring in for the fifth factory. But a replacement project is a little more difficult because what that means is you're replacing one factory with a newer, more efficient factory. And we're looking for the difference. What is the difference of the new factory, what it would bring in for us versus what the old factory would have created for us. And that gets a little more complicated. Now, when it comes to the, cap, the three different types of cash flow associated with a project, there are at least two, sometimes three cash flows associated with a capital budgeting project. And we'll look at these in just a second, but the first one is what's called the initial investment. This is what you are investing in the project, what you're spending. So whether it's a million, five million, 10 million, 75 million, I heard a story, um, what was I listening? I was listening to something yesterday. 
and it was talking about Columbus, Mississippi. Columbus, the reason I know about Columbus, Mississippi is because it was only about 20 miles across from Mississippi, which is uh, where Mississippi State's located. So I spent, uh, visited Columbus quite a bit when I was in school at Mississippi State. And when I was there, Columbus, Mississippi was a thriving town that was just kind of slowly drying up. I mean, it just, factories were closing down, people were out of work, there was a lot of poverty and a lot of government assistance in the area. Starting in about 2005, 2006, you started having some factories come back to the area. And one of the factories that were built was a Yokohama tire factory, a really high-tech factory, and Yokohama spent $300 million on that one factory. $300 million on one factory in Columbus, Mississippi. Now, you don't want to make a mistake when you're building a $300 million factory. You don't want to decide three or four years down the line, wow, we should have not have built in Columbus, Mississippi. Okay, so I mean, that takes a big leap of faith by the corporation willing to invest in a community like that. Um, and that's a lot of stockholders' money that they're investing. So they want to make sure to get it right. So their initial investment was $300 million. That's a negative cash flow. And that's what this represents is our negative sign. And this will make more sense whenever we're putting the numbers into our calculator. This will help us in terms of putting in a negative cash flow or a positive cash flow. Once you have invested in the project, then you hope it's going to create operating cash inflows. You hope they're inflows anyway. And this is the incremental after-tax cash inflows resulting from implementation of the project during its life. So we've built the $300 million factory. We've got it up and running, and we hope it produces items, tires in this case, that we can then sell that will create a positive cash flow. So that's what the the plus is for here. Okay, these are positive cash flows. Now, occasionally you may have a negative operating cash flow. Let's see, let me give you a simpler example of this. Okay, I'll go back to my old standby, the, the lawn mowing business. So you have a lawn mowing business and you're gonna make a capital investment capital budgeting decision to purchase a new lawnmower. It's an expansion project, so you're buying another lawnmower for your lawn mowing business. And it's one of these big 72 inch, zero turn, 30 horsepower diesel engine mowers that cost $12,000, $14,000. And that's a lot of money for your lawn mowing business to invest in a new mower. But you hope that because you're investing in the new mower, you can take on bigger projects, you can take on some corporate mowing jobs, and you can make a lot of money with this new mower. Now, when you invest the, the $12,000, that's your initial investment. And then you know you're gonna start mowing the first year, and you can mow a ton of yards with that new mower. So you're hoping it's gonna bring in a positive cash flow. But also, you know from past experience that after the third year of mowing, you're estimating so many hours per year of, of using the machine, you're going to have to take that machine out of service, tear the engine down, overhaul it, so it's going to be out of service for a while, it's going to cost a lot of money, and then you're going to put it back into service. Now you can do this during the off season, but it's going to cost so much money that your operating cash flow for that year is actually going to be negative because you can't mow enough yards to pay for the cost of the overhaul of the engine. So year one and two would be positive, year three would be negative, but then once you've got the engine overhauled, you know you're good for another two years. So year four and five would be po a positive cash flow. Does that make sense, sort of how, that's, how that works? Now that's with the lawn mowing business, it works the same way with a $300 million factory. Okay, there's no difference, just the number of zeros is the only difference. And then finally, some pro now not all projects, but some projects have what's called a terminal cash flow. 
And this is the cash flow at the very end of the project. So we're finished. Um, this can be positive or negative. For example, if my, my lawnmower example, I estimate that after using it for six years, I'm going to sell it. And I can sell that mower for $2,000 after six years. So that would be a positive terminal cash inflow once I sell the mower. There are some projects that have negative cash. For example, if you, uh, let's see. If you are an oil company and you've been drilling for oil and you, you, you hit oil several years ago, you've been pumping oil for, for 10 years, and finally the oil deposit runs out. Now, you've made a mess. Oil production is not a clean business, okay? You make a mess, you tear stuff up, you tear up the land, you make a mess, and you just can't take up your oil well and leave. You have to fix the damage that you've done. And so, a live drilling operation, you're going to have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars refurbishing the land, bringing in the dirt, maybe planting trees. It's going to take a lot of money. And so you actually might have a negative terminal cash flow with your oil drilling operation. Now, the hard part of this is looking into the future 5, 10, 15 years to determine are we going to have a terminal cash flow at all? And if we are, is it going to be positive or negative? And you can see the difficulty in estimating cash flows associated with capital budget. It's, it's just not an easy thing to do. <clears throat> now, this is a timeline showing these cash flows in operation. So this is a... We have a $50,000 investment, initial investment, so we're spending $50,000 on something, some asset. And then we are estimating, once we spend the money, it's gonna bring in each year 4,000, the second year 5,000, the third year 6,000, seven, seven, eight, 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 nine thousand, and then finally in year 10, a positive $10,000 cash flow. These are all positive operating cash flows. So if we go back here, the initial investment, the operating cash flows, and the terminal cash flow. Here's the initial investment. These are the operating cash flows. And then this project actually has a um, positive $25,000 cash flow in year 10. So apparently we can sell this asset for $25,000. Now, again, this will make more sense to you a little bit later. But the total cash flow for year 10 is going to be the $25,000 plus the $10,000. So if you're entering this into your calculator, it's going to be a total of $35,000 in time period 10. You remember with your financial calculator where you went to your, um, your CF button, the cash flow button, and you put in the cash flow at time period 0, the user down arrow, time period 1, 2, 3. That's what we're, what we're doing here when we get to, when we come back to chapter 10, we will be entering cash flows for capital budgeting purposes. And when we did it the first time in chapter 5, we didn't have a cash flow for time period zero, so we skipped past that. Well, this time we will, and it will be a negative cash flow. It'll be your initial investment. So you've already done this. We just did a little bit differently, Okay. So this is what it will look like for your capital budgeting investment. And this is what I talked about earlier, so we won't spend much time on this. Uh, this is talking about expansion versus replacement decision. And as was said earlier, an expansion simply means you're adding to what you already have. If you're a farmer, you already have three combines, you want to add a fourth. You, do your, you work the numbers. You don't buy a new combine just because you want one. I mean, it's just profit margins are too low. You can't spend $300,000 just for the hell of it. You have to have a good reason to spend $300,000 on a new combine. 
But if you do the numbers and you think, hey, yes, I can get the, enough benefit from this to compensate for spending $300,000 in terms of my harvest or efficiency or fuel savings or whatever, then you would expand. Now, you may decide to just replace an older combine. Let's say you've got an older model, you've been using it for 20 years. It doesn't get very good fuel efficiency. It, it breaks down a lot. You have to spend a lot on maintenance. It, you're, you're, you can't find parts for it. it it's got a, um, the heads on it. You're getting, you're finding trouble, uh, having trouble finding parts for it. It's narrow. You can't, uh, you can't cover a lot of area with it. And so you're going to buy a new, more efficient combine with a much wider head on it. So you can cover a lot of ground. You can harvest a lot of corn or soybeans quickly which means you're more efficient, that would be a replacement project. But the thing is, you have to determine, is replacing that combine, is it going to be worthwhile? Because that new one has to be a lot more efficient and save you a lot of money and create a lot more positive cash flow than the old one to compensate for buying the new combine. Does everybody follow me here on this kind of I know just explaining capital budgeting, sometimes it's kind of hard to get your mind wrapped around what we're doing. When we actually get into the calculation of it, then it will make a lot more sense to you, I promise. But you need to know the terms first uh, of what we're doing. Uh, let's see. Okay, we can skip past this one. This is simply talking about the relative cash flows for um, replacement decisions. So the initial investment, the operating cash flows, and the terminal cash flow. And a couple of other terms that you need to be familiar with. That is, what is a sunk cost and what is an opportunity cost? A sunk cost is a cash outlay that has already been made and has, the key thing is underlined here, it has no effect on your decision, on your capital budgeting decision. So you need to know that a sunk cost has no effect on your decision. What that means is basically a sunk cost applies to, if you're looking at two projects, it applies to both projects. So it doesn't factor into your initial investment, your operating cash flows, or your terminal cash flow. An opportunity cost, it's a cost that would be realized if you didn't undertake the next best alternative, and these do affect your decision. So this is pretty simple. You need to know that opportunity costs do factor into your capital budgeting decisions. Sunk costs do not factor in to your capital budgeting decision. It's not more complicated than that. And then this is an example of this, sunk cost versus opportunity cost. Um, and you can, you can read through this yourself, but it's talking about a drill press and um, Kind of, you know, how does it factor in versus, you know, what doesn't factor in. And that is chapter 11. Man, we covered parts of two chapters today. All of chapter 11, um, part of chapter 10, and I just think this is a good place to stop for the day. Okay, what we're going to start next are going to be the calculations associated with capital budgeting. So that's going to take us a while to get into that. I don't really want to start it. You forget it over Thanksgiving, and then I have to come back and, and go over it again. So we'll have plenty of time. Our two meetings that we have left after Thanksgiving, um, capital budgeting calculations, and then Chapter 12, which is what we call risk assessment techniques, uh, really simple. Remember your quiz number four is going to be open at two o'clock. It closes Tuesday. Everybody, if you're traveling for Thanksgiving, have a safe trip. I will see you back here the week after Thanksgiving. We will finish up. We'll talk about your final exam. We'll talk about your bonus exam and you will successfully finish Finance 330. So have a great break and I will see you back here after Thanksgiving.